terrific Shabbat with baby namings and bar mitzvahs and Earth Day and the start of Passover, our junior choir, start of the NBA playoffs, all of these amazingly important parts of our community. Um, but as a synagogue community, those of us who are connected to Beth Am um, know that we strive to be in dialogue and relationships um, with other faith-based institutions within our local community. And we operate with the belief that interfaith relationships offer Jews an opportunity to bridge cultural gaps, foster understanding and tolerance amidst diversity. Through such connections, we can enrich our own faith while contributing to be a more interconnected and harmonious world. I believe that the divine presence is heightened when we interact with others. And it is with that goal in mind that we often here at Beth Am turn our pulpit over to clergy of different faiths. This Shabbat, we welcome Pastor Dave Samuelson, the senior pastor of Los Altos United Methodist Church, LAUMC. Just down Foothill Expressway, LAUMC is a visionary church on the leading edge of outreach, justice, and spirituality. They operate as a change maker church, committed to following Jesus' example of compassion for all people and celebrating God's gift of diversity. LAUMC aims to create a church home where people of every gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, physical and mental ability, immigration, and socioeconomic status can unite in the mission of God's love. Dave and his wife, Sonia, who's here with him, have been married for 39 years and have five children. Four of their five children are adopted and two internationally adopted. In 2010 and 2015, Pastor Samuelson made pilgrimages to Israel where the opportunity connect to where he had the opportunity to connect to his paternal Jewish heritage. He has a lifelong interest in the intersection of science and faith, which has led to a great deal of involvement with the field of quantum physics. <coughs> he likes to be outdoors, and from 1997 to 2015, he made an annual climb to the summit of Mount Shasta in Northern California. Pastor Samuelson has a BA in economics from University of California, Berkeley, a Master's of Divinity from the Pacific School of Religion and the Graduate Theological Union, and a Doctorate of Ministry from the Asbury Theological Cemetery. Dave and I have been friends for about four years now, and Beth Am is delighted to have Pastor Samuelson address our congregation during our Arab Shabbat service. This evening, I think we can welcome him by clapping. <laughs> It's good to be here. Judaism has shaped me far more than most Methodist ministers. I really didn't know this until uh, at least three quarters of this shaping until probably my late 40s. I'm 63. So it's really been just over the last 15 years that most of this self-awareness has emerged. When Rabbi Jonathan reached out to me a couple months ago and invited me to speak, preach, here at the Shabbat service before Passover. Uh, I said, is there a theme? And he said, no, it's pretty much wide open. As I thought about that, I, I, I realized that uh, um, I think we're living in a time where interfaith connections are especially needed and to be deeply valued, and I do. And so I thought that what I really needed to do was to express how much gratitude I have toward Judaism, and by extension, you, how much you have shaped me. And I will seek to do that now. My father, Richard Edgar Samuelson, was born in Baltimore in 1927 into an observant Jewish family. Both his maternal and paternal ancestors were Russian fiddler on the roof, Jews living near Minsk until driven off their land and emigrating to America in the 1890s. They settled in three places, New York City, Baltimore, and Cincinnati. 
My dad's parents ran a small store in the Jewish Cheswold neighborhood in Baltimore. The store went under in the mid-1930s during the depth of the Depression, and they moved to Washington, D.C. because there was more work there. The move, coupled with the family's poverty, resulted in my dad not going through Hebrew school, not having a bar mitzvah, and missing out on most aspects of Jewish religious life. My dad's mother died when he was 11, and his father died four years later in 1942 when he was 15. His older brother, Jerome, was, had enlisted in the Navy, so when his father died, my dad was all alone in a rundown residential hotel in Washington. However, he had been told that if anything was to happen to his father, his wealthy uncle Kaufman, who lived in a mansion in Baltimore, would be there to take care of him. So following my, his father's death, he waited for his uncle Kaufman to come and get him. A week went by, no Uncle Kaufman. Two, three weeks went by, no Uncle Kaufman. So he used his coin collection to pay for a train ticket to Baltimore, and from the train station, he walked to Uncle Kaufman's house. Although he was given a room, it was made absolutely clear to my dad in numerous ways that he wasn't wanted there. So less than a month later, he ran away and took a job as a wiper, working in the hot boiler rooms of the small steamships that worked the Chesapeake Bay. He felt completely alone and distraught. Over the next couple of months, some of his Cincinnati relatives found out that he had run away. His aunt Celeste and Uncle Mort drove from Cincinnati to Baltimore to search for him. Considering it was the middle of the war, the chances of finding my dad were slim to none. Yet doggedly they searched and searched, and by the grace of God, they found him. Then they took him home to Cincinnati, where he was told that he was a son to them as much a son as if he had been a biological son instead of a nephew. Two years later, at the age of 17, he enlisted in the Merchant Marines and shipped out during the summer of 1945 after Germany had surrendered as the United States was preparing for an invasion of Japan. He used to say had Japanese not, the Japanese not surrendered, the invasion of Japan had taken place, we probably wouldn't be here. My dad would go on to forgive just about every person who had ever wronged him throughout his life. He simply did not hold grudges. The one exception, however, was his Uncle Kaufman. Yet as painful as the betrayal of his Uncle Kaufman, it created within my dad one of his greatest gifts, his love, appreciation, and loyalty to family and friends, community. Aunt Celeste and Uncle Mort searching and searching, eventually finding my dad after he had run away and them inviting him to live with them as family was one of the formational events in his life and by extension, my life. It connected my dad not only with his family in Cincinnati, but also with his larger family in New York City, including his Aunt Jewel, who was deeply involved and a leader in the kibbutz movement and supporting Zionism, leading to the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, an event my dad always spoke about with a deep sense of reverence. Beginning in 1945, when he became a merchant marine, my dad developed a practice of writing on a weekly basis to his community of family and friends, those who loved and supported him. Beginning with his Aunt Celeste and Uncle Mort and Aunt Jewel, but growing to include 50, 60, 70 people. In fact, the practice of him writing to his community of family and friends was something my dad did up until the day he died of a heart attack in 2004. My dad saved nearly every letter that he received, thousands of them that he treasured, like sacred scripture. They were in a large bureau in our living room growing up, and for each of those letters he received, there were probably two or three letters that he had written. For my sister Wynne and I growing up, my dad writing letters, 15 to 20 letters each and every week, was among the most indelible images of our childhood. To the end of the 1940s and through most of the 1950s, my dad served as a purser, the payroll accountant on a ship. As part of the Merchant Marines, except for the two years he served in combat during, in the Army during the Korean War. That took place all the way up until he and my mom were married in San Francisco in 1957. My dad's formal education had ceased when he was 15 upon his father's death. Yet in the mid-50s, he took the GED and then began taking extension courses at UC Berkeley. Although <clears throat> all through my childhood, in addition to my dad's day job as an accountant for the civilian arm of the Navy, on military sealift command, he was a student, taking classes at the UC Berkeley campus a couple of evenings every week. I would come to discover that education was very much at the core of the Jewish culture he was nurtured in. 
My dad was a workaholic, and there was an underside to that, including a great deal of stress he placed upon himself. He nonetheless had the strongest work ethic of any person I've ever known. My dad worked his way through the civil service system, and when he retired following a near-fatal automobile accident in 1975, he was a GS-14, with GS-15 being the highest level. He was one of a small handful of GS-14s to not have a college degree. My dad also had a second job, a Saturday job, as a stockbroker. Many Saturdays through my growing up, I went in with him to Frank Knowlton Company, a small brokerage firm on 12th and Broadway in downtown Oakland. There he worked, but he also taught me to navigate the world of investing, in stocks and bonds, something that has deeply affected me throughout my life. Again, I would come to discover that investing for the future betterment of one's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren had a clear connection to the culture that he was nurtured in. There I also got to meet my dad's amazing boss, Charlie Jenks, whose best friend was George Blanda, then the kicker for the Oakland Raiders. And yes, Mr. Jenks, with the assistance of George Blanda, would get tickets for my mom and I, my dad wasn't a football fan, my mom and I, to go to at least one Raider game each and every year. Mr. Jenks owned the company and he became like a second father to my dad. One Saturday when I showed up with my dad, Mr. Jenks showed me the new Xerox machine that they had just gotten. And together we played with it, pressing our face against the glass, <laughs> making copies. It was also on that day that Mr. Jenks said to me, using a phrase that became a part of our family lexicon, he said, David, there is one thing about your dad that is more important in my eyes than anything else. Your dad has a common touch. He treats every person the same, from Leon, the black man who runs our elevator in our building, to millionaire corporate bosses. I strive to have the common touch myself, and I hope you will as well. That common touch led to one of my dad's greatest gifts, incredible relational loyalty. My dad honored and valued and cherished relationships with families and friends with an incredible fierceness and love. You see, that betrayal of my dad by his uncle Kaufman had truly turned redemptive. My dad would never abandon, turn, reject, or chastise a family member or friend. And I would come to discover how his understanding of community shaped the way he responded, and I think survived, anti-Semitism. One Thanksgiving, we were having dinner with my mom's side of the family that lived in Portola Valley. That's right. Their house is, I checked it out, almost exactly three miles as a crow flies from us here. During dinner, my aunt, who grew up in a very wealthy and entitled, waspy and sadly anti-Semitic family in Chicago, used the anti-Semitic derogatory K-word at the Thanksgiving table. My dad, instinctively a survivor, through most of his life needed to maintain relationships in order to survive, knew that my aunt, his sister-in-law, loved him and used the term reflexively. His response was silence until the meal ended. Then he took out his well-worn Jewish prayer book and prayed the Kaddish prayer in what I always thought was Hebrew, but have come to realize was Aramaic. My dad very clearly and beautifully made known his Judaism through a prayer that he deeply loved. And although I didn't know it until just a few years ago, my dad was also praying for my aunt's redemption and healing. The Kaddish prayer that he prayed, the first part in English, may the great name of God be exalted and sanctified throughout the world, which he has created according to his will. May his kingship be established in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetime of the entire household of Israel swiftly and in the near future and say amen. I doubt that my aunt picked up on this. I don't even think she realized the word that she had said. However, everyone else around the table understood and valued and appreciated the way my dad dealt with the situation in an effort to speak truth with integrity while preserving and even building relational community. Shortly after my parents were married, my dad embraced Christianity, largely because Methodist Church at that time, 1960, was probably the least anti-Semitic Christian denomination in the United States. I know that's a weird way to say it, but it's true. My dad and I were actually both baptized on the same day in 1960 at First Methodist Church in Alameda. My mom had been a part of the church since her early teens through 
throughout my life, my dad was always the, most, the more encouraging and positive when it came to spirituality and being a part of a faith community. Community for my Jewish father was life. The last five years of my dad's life, my parents lived in a house we built for them next to our house in Wairika, California, where I pastored in the 90s and early 2000s. He and my mom became a part of the faith community I served, and my dad's common touch led him forming deep relational bonds with most of the congregation, nearly all of whom were present at his overflowing memorial in 2004. Strangely, I will add, most fortunately, the role of family members in my constantly increasing connection to Judaism would continue through my wife Sonia's mom, Dora. Dora was born in East Prussia, part of pre-World War II Germany. She was Jewish on her mother's side and Lutheran on her father's side. Her Lutheran roots largely spared her family from the Holocaust, or so we thought. Nonetheless, Dora absolutely did not ever talk about that part of her life. However, in the mid-1990s, our son Paul, Dora's first grandchild, did an oral history project on his grandmother's life. For some reason, Dora opened up not only her East Prussian childhood, but also about what took place when the family fled to the West to escape the advance of the Russian army during the last six months of the war, which ended with Dora in the Buchenwald concentration camp as the war ended. For over 50 years, she had hidden that from everyone. It's revealing resulted in confusion and dislocation and pain, but ultimately a redemptive connection for Sonia and me and our children, especially since following Sonia's dad's death in 2002, Dora lived with us for the last eight years of her life, during which she opened up that previously hidden chapter of her life. In many ways, the dark abyss of the Holocaust emerged as a paradoxically profound dimension of my life and faith. The year following Dora's death, I made my first pilgrimage to Israel. The key Christian shrines, the Church of the Nativity and the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, the traditional birth, death, and entombment sites connected with Jesus, proved not to be the experiential or spiritual epicenters for my pilgrimage. No, it was the Wailing Wall. But not only praying at Judaism's most sacred, Sight of equal significance was spending a good hour in the covered alcove adjacent to the Wailing Wall, where dozens of rabbis, each with their own library of Talmud text, engaged in that dynamic interchange of rabbinic Judaism. They delighted in my many questions about Torah and the prophets and science. It was the emergence of the realization that my own spirit was deeply congruent with that intense intellectual engagement that is rabbinic Judaism. This is the way faith works for me. The Jacob renamed Israel, one who wrestles with God, understanding of faith. This would lead to my discovery of Hillel as being the source of much of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in contrast to Shammai, the Jewish tradition that most profoundly shapes my vision of Christianity, the one that has always spoken to my heart and my mind. It would also lead to an even more integration of science and especially physics with my spirituality. The last 14 years I have connected at a much closer level with the Jewish community in every place that I have served as pastor. Made a second pilgrimage to Israel, formed a close friendship with Samuel and Paul, Pearl Ulner when we lived together in Eureka. And like most of you, shared the deep anguish of these last six months following October 7th. Finally, while I continue to function fairly well in an inclusive, progressive Christian church, at least 90% of my sermons are built around what I call an interfaith context, meaning that it has to be inclusive at a deep, an abiding level of both my dad and my mother-in-law. This has resulted in not only an intimate relationship with Judaism, but has broadened beyond the Judeo-Christian context to one inclusive of Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, and to the best of my capacity, all humanity. 
And best of all, this has not been a process so much of new discovery, but mostly a rediscovering, largely thanks to my father and mother-in-law, of that which has already been deeply and organically embedded within me. I close with the words of the first part of the Kaddish prayer, which I pray for you and for me this day. May the great name of God be exalted and sanctified throughout the world, which he has created according to his will. May his kingship be established in your lifetime and in your days and in the lifetime of the entire household of Israel swiftly and in the near future and say amen.